Well, that guy in the trench coat outside the stadium swore that these seats were on the 50-yard line. Instead, I'm here at the 200-yard line? What kind of football field is this, anyway? I suppose Sketchy U plays by their own rules, which has nothing to do with them ending the half with a 108-point lead. Anywho, while the band marches through the halftime show, we'll march right through the basics of NMR spectroscopy, a technique that can be used to determine the structure and identity of a compound. The first thing to know about nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, or NMR, is that, in the simplest terms, it uses a giant magnet to measure the amount of electron density surrounding a nucleus. That's why the sketchy Spartans use a one-of-a-kind magnetic goalpost that definitely does not give them any unfair advantage. Mm -mm, nope, nothing to see here, moving on. Anyway, electron density near an atom shields a positively charged nucleus from feeling the effects of the magnet. Sort of like this negative shield will protect our mascot with the positive helmet as he goes into battle against the visiting fans' peanut shells and beer cans. From there, the NMR spectrometer measures just how much each nucleus in the sample was shielded from the magnet's effects, and reports this information back in graph form. Hydrogen, or proton NMR, reports a peak for each inequivalent hydrogen nucleus in the compound, while carbon NMR reports a peak for each inequivalent carbon nucleus. More on equivalence and inequivalence in a bit. You'll probably encounter proton NMR more than carbon NMR, so we'll focus on proton from here on out. The parts per million scale is used on all NMR spectra, hence how distances on this field are measured in ppm. The basic idea is that the spectrum is calibrated to a reference peak for a highly shielded nucleus, usually from the compound tetramethylsilane, or TMS. The TMS peak is set to zero. Any nucleus that experiences less shielding than TMS will respond more strongly to the NMR's magnet. The proportional amount of this response is measured, and the distance away from the TMS reference peak is called the chemical shift, which you can remember by the fact that the new numbers this guy is painting are slightly shifted off of the originals. For proton NMR, the practical range of the spectrum is from about 0 to 10 parts per million. That's why one side of the football field appears to end at the 10-yard ppm line. Technically, peaks can appear higher or lower than 0 to 10, but that range covers the vast majority of protons and organic compounds. Okay, so how do you make sense of an NMR spectrum? First thing you'll need is some terminology. Like we said before, when a proton is surrounded by a lot of electron density, it doesn't feel the effects of the giant magnet very much. We call a proton like this shielded and its location near zero parts per million in the NMR spectrum is called upfield. That's why the shield-bearing Spartan is upfield by the zero-yard line. The opposite end of the spectrum, down near 10 parts per million, is called, you guessed it, downfield. Bear in mind that upfield and downfield are relative terms, so a peak at 2 parts per million would be considered upfield of a peak at 5 ppm. The location of a proton in an NMR spectrum is very sensitive to the amount of electron density surrounding it, including electron density from neighboring atoms and bonds. So, a given proton's chemical shift can tell you a lot about what groups are nearby. Proximity to highly electronegative groups, or polar bonds, shift a proton downfield. This creates a standard set of chemical shifts that are characteristic of certain functional groups. Let's check out these spectators to see the specifics. The proton attached to the oxygen atom of a carboxylic acid, symbolized here by this low-tech cheer box, is highly deshielded. It's attached to an electronegative oxygen atom, after all. Proton like that will appear far downfield, around 10 or more ppm. The proton right next to the carbonyl carbon on an aldehyde has its electron density cruelly sucked away by the doubly bonded oxygen. As such, Aldehyde protons appear around 9 parts per million. Sort of like our shy spectator Al is hiding near the 9-yard line. Ooh, what's that smell? Ooh, is, oh, is that a hexagonal burger I detect? Mm. Must be there to remind us that protons on aromatic rings appear around 7 parts per million. And the keen sniffer on this pup is 
not missing the smell of that burger. We place the keen weenie right here where alkene protons appear, around five parts per million. I can't tell if this guy is hiding his eyes or just doing an elaborate cheer, but his arms are making an X as a reminder that the protons on carbons bonded to electronegative X atoms show up around three to four parts per million. Common example of this is the protons bonded to an alcohol's carbon, which is why this dude's also wearing an oh-so-classy Coe's Light shirt. Must be a pretty big game with a celebrity appearance like this. We got the singer from the Ketones a cappella group on campus wearing his signature carbonyl key necklace. He is at the two-yard line to remind you that the protons on carbons attached to carbonyls, like ketones, show up around two parts per million. Finally, we have the Spartans' most dedicated fan. This octogenarian alumna hasn't missed a down since 1959. She's waving her cane to symbolize that the CH bonds of alkanes and alkane-type groups come way upfield in the zero to two parts per million neighborhood. So, those are some of the most common chemical shifts that you can look for to clue you in on which functional groups are present in a sample. But, there's even more information you can get from a proton NMR spectrum, and these cheerleaders are absolutely jazzed about it. They're going to introduce us to integration. Integration is the area under a peak, and this value tells you how many equivalent protons are represented by that peak. The cheerleaders in each formation are wearing equivalent uniforms to symbolize these equivalent protons. Two protons are equivalent if replacing either of them with a random X group creates the same molecule no matter which hydrogen you replace. The two formations contain a different number of people because the integration value of a peak differs depending on numbers of equivalent protons it contains. Just like there's more space beneath the four-person formation, the greater the area under a peak, the more protons it represents. There's one more valuable kind of information you can get from a proton NMR spectrum, and that comes from peak splitting, or how many mini peaks make up each major peak. Let's check out the drum majors to see more. Peak splitting tells you how many protons are on the atom next door to the atom whose peak you're analyzing. Let's call the number of protons on the next door carbon N like the shape of these batons. If the proton you're analyzing is adjacent to a carbon bearing N protons, your peak will be split into, can I get a drum roll please? N plus one sub peaks. That's called the N plus one rule. So if there are two protons on the next door carbon, the original peak will be split into three sub peaks called a triplet with the tallest sub peak in the middle just like this triplet of drummers next door to the two drum majors. Now, before we gear up for the third quarter, let's take a gander at this fella in the C helmet to talk about carbon NMR. He's sporting unlucky number 13 because C NMR uses carbon 13 isotopes. And this ill-fated footballer is all by his lonesome to represent that the peaks in carbon NMR are all singlets. There's no splitting. The peaks also can't be integrated. That means you can't determine anything about neighboring carbons or the number of equivalent carbons. What you can tell from a carbon-13 NMR spectrum is the chemical shift locations of all the sets of chemically inequivalent carbons in a molecule. The chemical shifts to carbon atoms in a carbon NMR spectrum appear at ppm values about 20 times those of the values in a proton NMR. So, if the protons of a particular functional group would come in at about two parts per million in the proton NMR, the carbon itself will come out at about 40 parts per million in the carbon-13 NMR. The yard line numbers on the player side of the field show you the rough correlation. I guess halftime's over. Uh, that's our cue to wrap up. NMR spectroscopy uses a big magnet to probe the electron density around individual nuclei in a molecule and create a spectra. When a nucleus is more shielded by electrons, it creates a peak further to the right or upfield, and the more deshielded it is, the further to the left or downfield it'll be. This fact can be used to identify particular functional groups in a proton NMR spectrum, which goes from 0 ppm, or parts per million, to around 10 ppm. Electron-poor groups appear closer to 10, and electron-rich groups appear closer to 0.
proton NMR spectroscopy can also tell you how many equivalent protons give rise to a particular peak by looking at the area under the peak or the integration value. You can also use proton NMR to determine the number of next door protons by looking at peak splitting, which is governed by the n plus 1 rule. And finally, carbon NMR spectroscopy identifies carbon atoms in a molecule. The same general rules apply as in proton NMR, but only single unsplit peaks are observed. Also, the chemical shift scale in carbon NMR is about 20 times greater than that in proton NMR. Well, I think it's safe to say Sketchy has this one in the bag. I'm going to abandon these cheap seats before the visiting team catches on to their tactics and things get even sketchier around here. Whew.